Hi, Yarun. Okay, hello everybody, uh, and welcome to the Monsoon Geo Seminar. Seems that we have a diehard core of uh, Monsoon enthusiasts already on, waiting for the others for another half a minute. We have the pleasure to have uh, Professor Bill Lukens from uh, James Madison University. He will be talking about the monsoon uh, as a uh, studied on fossil wood, which I was surprised to find out in a short conversation before that actually is not uh, silicified or calcified, it's actually wood, you can burn it, make barbecue. But um, yeah, digressing aside, um, Bill uh, has graduated from Baylor University where he continued as a postdoc and then with a postdoc at uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette. And he's been working uh, as a, focusing on terrestrial paleo uh, climatology uh, with a lot of in, exciting research in uh, Eastern, Northeastern Africa and Kenya and in uh, North American Great Plains and has developed a, a recent interest in, uh, in the monsoon. And we, were we are lucky to have him talk about uh, paleo monsoon in Oligocene uh, as seen in the ice top composition of uh, fossil woods. Uh, now to you, Bill, looking forward to this talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me get my screen set up here. Okay. All right. So uh, today I'm, I'm excited to talk about some recent results from ongoing work that my colleagues and I have been doing on, on a really interesting substrate, uh, fossil wood that really in all intents and purposes is mummified. It, it's not the traditional fossil wood that we think of. We'll typically think of something like per mineralized wood or silicified wood. And here's a, a picture of what I'm talking about where you can still see the internal anatomy. You can cut it with a razor blade or with a Dremel and believe it or not, get oligocene age sawdust on your hands as you're doing it. Okay. So first I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, this work is, is ongoing, and it's uh, being done in conjunction with some really great scientists on our team, uh, Dr. Brian Schubert at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And a lot of the work uh, that uh, forms today's material uh, was done by Jamie Vornlocker as part of her master's thesis. She's now a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Cheng Xuan at uh, Chang'an University in China, and his PhD student, Junbo Ren at Jilin University, uh, are excellent collaborators. Some of the work uh, towards the end of the presentation will draw on Junbo's ongoing work, which is really top quality. 
And also Zachary Strasberg here at JMU has been doing some really exciting work uh, with me and his ongoing conversations with me have certainly improved this work. And I'd also like to thank the organizers. This series has is, is really been magnificent. Okay, so let's go over to East Asia and, uh, and Greater Eastern Asia here to uh, center us on the area for the talk today. Uh, there have been a number of presentations that have focused on the large scale uh, picture of the Asian monsoons. So I won't go into all the details of them, but uh, there are subdivisions of the Asian monsoon regions. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the East Asian monsoon. And the seasonal, uh, the seasonality of the East Asian monsoon really involves this sea breeze that comes in in the summer, drawing warm, moist air into the low pressure systems on land. And it's really driven by thermal contrast between uh, the, the continent and the surrounding oceans, in contrast with other lower latitude monsoon areas that are influenced primarily by the migration seasonally of the intertropical convergence zone. The location for today's study is in Nanning in southern China. And so today it's located comfortably within the East Asian monsoon. It's right near an area that some people divide out and call the transitional area uh, between the East Asian monsoon and the South Asian or Indian monsoon. And we're not really interacting with the Western North Pacific monsoon or uh, the Austral uh, monsoon um, below to the south. All right, so for some context, a really big question that is ongoing and perennial and, and not yet answered in monsoon research is when did the East Asian or sea breeze style monsoon in East Asia initiate? And the answer depends on what substrate one studies and what the parameters are that goes into many of these beautifully complex models that, uh, that continue to inform us uh, to this day. And so depending on the proxy, so, you know, a lot of these proxies only have substrates that go back to the start of the Miocene. And so the answer for some of these is, well, we see East Asian monsoon signals around the Paleogene, Neogene uh, boundary, but in some cases there just isn't material to work with in the Oligocene, or it's just more rare. Uh, but there are some circumstances where studying polyniflora or uh, plant fossils by uh, by some authors has revealed evidence of potential East Asian monsoon signals across China, modern China, uh, as far back as the Middle Eocene. And what's interesting is different models point to different uh, timings of the initiation of the monsoon. And, you know, the modelers can, can tell us a lot more about what goes into getting this answer. But I think the consensus at this point suggests that maybe there's a weak East, East Asian monsoon in the Paleogene. And the Oligocene-Miocene boundary is really an important time interval for studying the development of the EAM in deep time. However, really importantly, we don't have much information from specific proxy reconstructions from the Oligocene. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is from Guo et al. in 2008, so several years ago at this point, but the conclusions still hold. In the Eocene, you can see all of these different colored areas uh, all these individual points are spots where we have proxy records. Across a Oligocene, there's a good number, but by the time we get to the late Oligocene, a few million years leading up to the Miocene, the proxies in Southern China in this East Asian monsoon affected area practically vanish. And so we have very little information from what we now know is a very critical time interval. So that is the motivation for our studies of these wood fossils from Nanning, because we're hoping to just further develop the records from this time interval and maybe refine our understanding of the paleoclimate conditions in Southern China during this important time. Now, I'd like to state up front that all paleoclimate proxies have inbuilt trade-offs. Uh, so here is just a cartoon where the y-axis is the frequency of how often we see a certain paleoclimate proxy in the rock record going from almost never seen to it's all over the place. And the x-axis is how much time gets averaged, in, averaged into the signal that the proxy reports. So we have things like paleosols, ancient soils. These form over thousands of years, many thousands of years. So they're averaging mean annual conditions over very long periods of time but they're pretty common in the rock record. So you can get these really nice long-term average signals, 
but it comes with a trade-off of, okay, you're not gonna look at a very high resolution short temporal interval. In, uh, in a lot of the paleo monsoon studies, uh, particularly in uh, China and India, we, we find fossil leaves and phytolists and pollen being the primary substrates that are giving us proxy results. And these are pretty common if we're looking at something like phytolists or pollen, a little more rare to find fossil leaves in the rock record. And we're still doing a bit of time averaging. So these, these are substrates where, you know, think of a forest, it grows, takes time to establish. And then the leaves represent a year of growth, but it, really the characteristics of the leaves are evolving and adapting to an ecosystem scale time interval. And then we have this really wonky, weird substrate of mummified wood, which is almost absent in the rock record. It, it's very, very difficult to find non-mineralized wood in the rock record. But if we read those signals very carefully, we get some tantalizing, interesting evidence of even the sub-annual time resolution. And so today I'm going to just be upfront I know this is a rare substrate, but we're gonna dive into some of the really interesting information that we can read from this interesting and rare substrate. The wood fossils in this talk are part of the Santang Lagerstätte uh, in Nanning in Southern China. Here's a picture of, uh, of where the fossils are coming out of this mummified plants layer. There's a dump truck for scale. Uh, this is in on the border of the city of Nanning. On the wood fossils are late oligocene based on the mammalian fossils and polynomorphs associated with them. On, and you know, they're, they're just incredibly well pre preserved. Here's a thin section of one of these fossils that was reported in Huang et al. Uh, and you can see the division between the early wood where the pores are really big. Uh, this is spring growth of, of the trees. And then the transition of the late wood where we have more densely packed cells. And this is one of these fossils. You can even see in hand sample, these beautiful rings that are preserved. Uh, and so we have cellular structures preserved on nearly perfectly in these fossils. Lives all over Southeastern Asia. Uh, this is a broadleaf evergreen assemblage. These are evergreen, not deciduous trees. Oh, my internet's a little unstable, apologies. These are broadleaf evergreen ecosystems. So these trees are growing year round. They like humid conditions. And from all of the paleofloral analysis, it seems like the best modern analog for these ecosystems is indeed Southeast Asia today in the monsoon affected areas. So the big research questions for today are the following. In Southern China, in the latest Oligocene, using Nanning as our basis, do these wood fossils preserve quantitative evidence for precipitation seasonality, like we see in the modern monsoon today? On um, What's the mean annual precipitation and can we get at that quantitatively? And I won't be able to get to this today, but part of our ongoing work is to actually use these fossils to reconstruct temperature seasonality as well. And this is, when I say seasonality, I mean variations in rainfall and temperature across individual years in the late Oligocene. And then a big question that I'll draw on and as a point of comparison is how do our estimates from the past compare to what we see today? at modern weather stations. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about carbon stable isotopes in the wood tissue of these fossils. And so let's do a little primer on what sets the value of carbon stable isotopes in a tree, because we just have a wonderful interdisciplinary assemblage of scientists joining us here. So I'm not gonna assume that many people understand the, the basis of delta C13 values in wood. It's very specific to some disciplines. So as trees grow, they photosynthesize, they make their mass by sucking in CO2 from the air. So the baseline first step in setting the delta C13 value of the wood tissue is the source CO2 carbon isotope ratio. So that's the atmospheric CO2's delta C13 value. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, partial pressure also matters. In deciduous trees, they drop their leaves in the winter and then draw on stored sugars early in the year to make uh, new new growth. And so the storage of sugars early uh, over the winter and drawing on those stored sugars is another carbon source that would affect the signal. We don't have to worry about that with evergreen wood. The light regime and precipitation also affect the amount that a tree can photosynthesize. And that's really just the amount that a tree can fractionate the atmosphere 
or in deciduous trees, the, the wood, uh, the, the stored sugars, that source uh, in, and the fractionation that goes into the manufacturing of these, uh, these wood tissues. Uh, the light regime and precipitation also control things like evapotranspiration and the modulation of, of drawing in the CO2 into leaves. And so these, these are multivariate factors that combine in different ways uh, to influence photosynthesis. And then after photosynthesis, there's also remobilization of compounds. Uh, and this is really just starting to get better understood. Uh, and, and this is one area where we have a lot of room to improve our predictive models. So what we know is that when we look across growth, growth rings of modern evergreen trees, we tend to see a delta C13 pattern where we go from lower values up to higher values and then back down to lower values in a kind of sinusoidal pattern throughout the year where growth would be going from the left to the right. And this is a pattern that's you know, the epitome of evergreen growth. Uh, deciduous growth has a real like jagged sawtooth pattern that would almost look like this flipped upside down. And so this is one way that we can be sure, anatomy aside, that these delta C13 values are coming from an evergreen tree. Okay, so I know not many people love equations uh, in presentations, so I'm going to make this brief, but I'd like to just go over what our independent variables are, what we're measuring here, and what we can predict. And this is uh, a proxy based on work by Brian Schubert and Hope Jaren several years ago. So here's what we can measure on modern and fossil trees. We can measure the delta C13 values. And I'm gonna talk about this variable called H or height. It's the amplitude of these delta C13 values where we take the peak delta C13 value and subtract from that the preceding earlier in the year minimum delta C13 value. And that's really just telling us the amount of photosynthesis uh, with these other competing variables that's going on. And so here's an example where the H value would be 3.4. And so it'd be, you know, uh, a, a higher value minus a lower value. And this is a 3.4 per mil difference in 1992 for this example. And this example shows us a lower H value, a lower amplitude. We can measure that directly by doing our stabilized isotope measurements. We slice up the tree rings into little segments and, and voila pretty easy to measure. Now the H value, this amplitude is a function of a few other uh, variables here. Key of which is uh, the atmospheric CO2's composition. And there's a really neat thing that happens on earth today where there is a seasonal change in the Delta C13 value throughout the year in the atmosphere. There's also a seasonal change in the partial pressure of CO2. And that's just a function of photosynthesis in the Northern hemisphere because the vast majority of land masses that have vegetation on them is situated in the Northern hemisphere today. So here's a neat transect from Keeling et al in 2005 where we're going from the South all the way North. And uh, so here would be the equator. And as we go North, you can see that these are profiles throughout uh, several years of Delta C13 values on monthly uh, measurement scales. And you can see that the amplitude of the delta C13 values of the gas in the atmosphere gets greater and greater and greater as one goes north. And so we can actually predict delta C13 uh, values of CO2 amplitudes by fitting a function to latitude. So if we know something about latitude, we can actually estimate this in the modern or the past. And then this is really the key thing that we want to predict. We can measure it today to train this proxy and get things like these coefficients. But this is six-month precipitation seasonality. It's really just a balance of the amount of rain precipitation that falls in the winter versus in the summer. So PW is winter rainfall, winter precipitation. PS is summer precipitation. And this is uh, oriented with essentially how trees grow throughout the year. So we're, this is not calendar year winter. It's actually November through April. So it's winter as trees experience it, generally speaking. And then summer is May through October. And then this 0 0.73 accounts for some of these post photosynthetic processes. Uh, and we're using this as a constant. It seems to work really well in this model, but we know that there's room to improve this and maybe make it into a function instead of a constant.
Okay, so if we rearrange this into something that we can measure or estimate everything on the right side of the equation to come up with a prediction, I'm going to frame all of this today in, in this ratio of PS to PW, the summer dominance of rainfall over winter, essentially. It's a six-month metric. We can measure, again, delta C13 values on fossil or modern wood, and we can use latitude or an estimate of paleo latitude to get at this source issue of delta C13 in the atmosphere. I really hope that some of you are thinking, well, how well do we know this in the past? And I'll come back to that later. There's ways that we can test this. Now, what's really interesting is if we have an estimate of total annual rainfall, rainfall or P total, we can actually parse this ratio of PS and PW into actual amounts. It rains this much in the summer, this much in the winter, because summer and winter added together is P total. And so uh, I will get into that shortly as well. Here's the experimental design for this study. On uh, First, what we're going to do is we're going to apply this globally calibrated proxy onto the local scale in southern China in Nanning. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, we're using records from a weather station nearby. This is the Nanning weather station from the China Meteorological Administration. We've got many decades of uh, observations of modern weather here. And then we've got two cores from living evergreen trees, two Mason's pine trees that are growing nearby in a park uh, right near Nanning. And then we also have the fossil site. This is where the Nanning fossils are located. And so this provides a way for us to make sure that the global proxy actually is giving us a correct answer in an East Asian monsoon affected area today. And then we can also then apply this, extend this back to the late Oligocene. Okay, so here's what the Nanning weather station records look like. Again, here we are at the Nanning weather station. The blue bars show precipitation on a monthly basis. And down here I've shown PS versus PW. Just to reorient ourselves, I know it's very odd to think of non-calendar year uh, months here, but PW would start in the previous November and go through April. And PS goes from May through October. Regardless of where this transition occurs, how you parse PS versus PW, you can see that PS here is capturing the vast majority of what any normal observer would say is summer precipitation. And so today this is captured pretty well. Uh, we can see that there is a preponderance of rainfall in the summer today in southern China. And this also is reflected in temperature seasonality as well. Uh, so there's a, a pretty good oscillation of temperature that coincides with oscillation in uh, rainfall. Now, we can also look at the probability densities or kernel densities of PW, winter rainfall, and PS, summer rainfall. And this is in the mode of how I'll be presenting the results from the proxy as well. So this is the weather station record. We've got 66 years of observa observations to play around with. And these here, these dots show the median value. So the median summertime precipitation in Nanning is about a meter of rainfall, 1,000 millimeters a year. And then in the winter, the median is something like 250 to 300 millimeters a year. And so we've got, you know, on, on the order of a, a three to one ratio of summer to winter rainfall. So 77%, 75% of rainfall occurs in the summer on, in any given year. These bars are around the median estimates are the 95% confidence interval. So uh, this, this is a robust way to say, all right, within this bracket is the median value uh, for PS and PW. And we can see that in no year does it rain more in the winter than in the summer. Um, so there we go. That's a picture of what Nanning looks like today. Here are the tree cores of the, the Pinus masoniana, the Mason's pine that are growing uh, on the outskirts of Nanning today. Uh, these records go back to the 1960s, but again, we've only sampled a, a relatively brief interval of time because this is very intensive sampling uh, to get to build up these very impressive sub-annual resolution scales of delta C13 values. What we're doing is we're taking a razor blade and going into an individual tree ring and slicing little tiny slices of wood and analyzing each slice on an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. And so for the proxy test here, what we've done is we've sampled two different individual 
pine trees growing between 1990 and 2000. So that's 11 rings per tree. So 22 rings from the modern totaling up to 317 slices just on these two cores alone. Uh, this is a lot of time in the lab that Jamie spent and she did a wonderful job. So the average, on average, we're getting something like 14 samples per ring with a range of, uh, this, this should be eight to 22 per ring, not eight to 12. Uh, and, and so the resolution that we can go at here is on the order of about 0.2 millimeters per slice. So very, very thin slices. It's hard to do better than that. Here are the three fossil specimens uh, that, that we're working with here. So again, the fossil site is right nearby the modern uh, tree core locality. Uh, for this intra-ring sampling, how we do this is we cut out uh, a little pathway through these fossils. You can do that with a Dremel very easily. Uh, all of these, these are polished uh, fossils with some light reflecting on them. Uh, so you can clearly see the internal architecture of these trees. And we go for an area where the, the rings aren't undulating too much. We have a total of 518 slices across these three uh, samples. And the average is about 25 slices per ring. And again, we're going at the best resolution we can, about 0.2 millimeters uh, per slice. And some of these are pretty thick rings. Uh, so, you know, our, our best ring, we've, we've got 43 slices. This, this is a pretty Herculean effort uh, to, to get all these data. Here's what these profiles look like for the modern Mason's pine. Uh, so on the, the y-axis, we've got delta C13 values scaled the same for both. Uh, and then we're going on the x-axis, we've got years from 1990 going all the way up to 2000. And so, you know, we've got over 150 slices in each of these cores, and that defines the, these oscillations pretty well in, in each of these. And so we can see that there's a pretty regular pattern, and the patterns match up pretty well between, across each of these rings. Something you'll notice is the exact value of, for example, in 1990, the starting value, the delta C13 measurement itself differs between the two rings. And that's well known in, in any tree, every tree is a little particular. And so the exact value is going to be different for exact the same amount of time between two individuals. So what we can do is we can actually just plot this as an anomaly, deviation from the average for each ring. And you can see that the patterns across each year, show up really well with few exceptions. And so when we're doing something like measuring an H value, this is one of our key input uh, variables here. This is what we're doing. We're taking the maximum divide or minus the, the preceding minimum. And so you can see a few examples there. And the rings that we have really big H values are the same across these two profiles, same with the smaller ones. Here are the records for the fossil trees. And the y-axis is a little expanded just because the values, the delta C13 values, vary a bit between each of these samples. Uh, so we, we've expanded out the y-axis, which makes these oscillations look a little smaller. Uh, there's also a little bit of a walk in, in this sample. Uh, but the y-axis are, are scaled to be the same uh, vertical distance uh, for each of these samples. And so you can see that uh, we'll, we'll take the maximum value minus the preceding minimum for each of these. The shapes are a little different than the modern, but overall the H values are very well constrained and we have a very large sample number, meaning that we likely have captured this oscillation within rings pretty well with, with a high level of accuracy here. Okay, so uh, I, I have a reminder of what these proxy input variables are here, and I've plotted PS to PW as the ratio. So this is the first ratio without making any, uh, any assumptions aside from latitude or paleo latitude. Uh, this is uh, the, the set of results that we get. The gray shading is the, the range of PS to BW values at the modern weather station. So this is essentially the truth for today. And when we apply this proxy using our measured H values and latitude of today on the living trees, we get these two uh, distributions of values where the horizontal bar is showing us for the two modern trees, the median. And then these, these whiskers on these box and whisker plots are plotted such that the 95% confidence interval is shown 
uh, for all of the, the values. How are these calculated? Well, this is a really, really robust way of calculating uncertainties where we know we have H values, but to be careful, we've added a 10% uncertainty on these measured H values just to make sure that maybe we didn't get quite all of the signal. Uh, we've also added an uncertainty in the latitude for today and a bigger uncertainty for the past. There's a lot of reason to think that the paleo latitude was similar to today, but we put a bigger error window on it. And then what we do is we take the observed H values and the known latitude or estimated paleo latitude, and we calculate a distribution of, of those estimates, 10,000 of these. And so we make essentially what are called resamples. This is a Monte Carlo resampling. So for any of these substrates, we're calculating PS to PW based on 10,000 possible H values across the whole range that we can think would be reasonable given what we measured, 10,000 latitudes or paleo latitudes. And then what we're doing is we're solving and getting 10,000 solutions of PSPW. And so that accounts for really all of the uncertainty that we can dream up for these. And what we find is that in the modern, these two modern trees are giving us median central tendencies, the, the majority of these estimates are falling within the range of the answer for today, the PSPW value for today. In no case are we getting any values below one, meaning a value that would indicate winter dominated precipitation. So we take this to mean that the proxy is, is giving us a robust result for the modern. And here's the answer for the ancient. It's really indistinguishable from today. And so in the late Oligocene, the PSPW ratios appear to be very, very similar to modern PSPW ratios uh, for these wood fossils. Here again are the probabilities of uh, summer precipitation and winter precipitation uh, from the weather station. And so if we want to take these PSPW ratios and ascribe an actual number for PS or a number for PW, we have to use some P total or mean annual precipitation value. This is the modern mean annual precipitation at the weather station. And so we can certainly use that for the living trees. What we've also done is we've used this value for the fossil trees as well with the uncertainty from the whole record because the, the paleoflora has the best modern analog of generally in this region anyway today. And so we're using a value of about 1300 millimeters as the late Oligocene average annual rainfall. I'll get back to whether or not that's a reasonable estimate shortly. So here's what the picture looks like. For the modern tree cores, the PS and PW estimates look very similar to uh, today uh, uh, from the weather station. And we don't get any overlap in the 95% confidence intervals, this very robust accounting of errors. And in the late Oligocene fossil wood, we're getting a really, really similar result. And again, no overlap in this really wide error bar that we've purposely put there for all of our uncertainty. And so the answer is really similar in the past and today. What we're finding is that the summer rainfall was about 75% of annual rainfall in today. And we're finding that the summer rainfall in the late Oligocene appears to be about 80% of the total annual rainfall in the late Oligocene given our assumptions. Now, Wang and Lin Ho have defined monsoon regions based on meteorological parameters. And to be a monsoonal climate, PS has to be more than 55% of P total. We certainly have met that metric here. And the average rainfall rate has to be greater than three millimeters a day in the summer. And so today, during this PS window, the average rainfall rate's 5.3 millimeters a day and the 95% confidence intervals above this threshold value. And we find this a similar number in the, the late Oligocene, knowing that we're actually averaging this across the entire interval of May to October. And we know that the majority of summer rainfall actually is in a more narrow window. So these are probably underestimates. Okay. So what's up with this oscillation of delta C13 values in the atmosphere? Here is the geography for today. And we know that as we go more north, because there's more photosynthesis in the summer, the atmospheric CO2 
uh, all, all of this carbon, the, the really light carbon from the atmosphere gets sucked into the biosphere, which leaves the CO2 remaining in the atmospheric reservoir to be heavier or more enriched. And so what we find is that as plants grow throughout the year, they're taking in more and more heavy carbon, which contributes to their ability to, to generate their own unique Delta C13 signal. What does the oligocene paleogeography look like? Well, this is just one example of a paleogeography from the oligocene. Previous talks have addressed this in, in great detail in this series, uh, but uh, this is this is one example. Uh, this, this actually should be from, uh, yeah, that's the right one. Uh, you you can see the northern hemisphere is uh, has far and away more landmass than the Southern Hemisphere in terms of areas that the majority of net primary productivity is occurring. And so this pattern of increasing Delta C13 with latitude was very likely similar or maybe even enhanced in the Oligocene. And so we sought to ask this question, what happens if we change this value or th this variable to different values in our solutions? So here's our sensitivity analysis where on the y-axis we have the proportion of summer rainfall to total rainfall throughout the year estimated for the late oligocene fossils. The x-axis is this annual oscillation in delta C13 source gas, the atmosphere, uh, where zero would be a zero per mil, no oscillation, just totally flat. There's no change throughout the year. Uh, and two would be a two per mil oscillation. Today at Nanning, uh, it's like 0.35 per mil oscillation in uh, CO2. And so the one X is the value for today. The three X, three times the modern value is what we see pretty much at the North Pole today. And so this would be a really extreme case and anything to the right would be crazy compared to what we, we think would work in the Oligocene. Uh, so we're likely falling to the right of this, this 1x line. These dashed lines are the minimum, maximum, and mean H values that we see in the fossil wood. And so really the answer here is this 0.5 threshold of summer dominated rainfall. And, oops, sorry, my internet's a little unstable. So the big story here is for any condition that we can dream up, we're probably at least underestimating the amount of summer rainfall. And in the late Oligocene, for the H values we measure, and for any crazy circumstance we can dream up, PS was probably at least 50% of P total and likely much more in the late Oligocene. And so we're getting very, very clear and confident signals of summer dominated rainfall in the late Oligocene. Now we're also trying to get at this question of, well, is our estimate of paleo precipitation totals, P total, or mean annual precipitation from the past, is it reasonable? And for this, we can use the oxygen isotopes of tree tissue. This is work done by John Bo Wren, who's in the audience, and this is part of his uh, PhD research that we're collaborating on. On the delta O18 value of tree tissue reflects meteoric water or rainwater. On in low latitudes, this signal is controlled by the amount of rainfall, the amount effect by Dansgaard. On in higher latitudes, this is influenced primarily by the temperature in the atmosphere uh, as condensation occurs, and also the transport distance, Rowley distillation of these masses of air. To do this, uh, Junbo's done a whole ring analysis, so take up a whole ring from one of these fossils and uh, mill it up and extract the cellulose out. Here's a little flake of cellulose. This is a substrate in wood that we use to make things like paper. Uh, and if we're by controlling for the material within the wood, we can actually get a pretty exact measure of the Delta O18 from the past meteoric water. So what's really neat is this extraction of this compound called cellulose allows us to look back into the Oligocene on annual average bases to see the Delta O18 value of past rainwater. And so today in Nanning, what we find is here again, these bars are throughout the year, going from uh, January to December, here's the summer, we see more rainfall, the, these, these bars are the rainfall. 
When we see peaks in rainfall in the summer every year, on average, this dashed line is the delta 18 of the meteoric water. You can see this big dip that mirrors the increase in rainfall in the summer. This is the amount effect. This is the lowering of delta 18 values as a function of increased rainfall at low latitudes. Here is a compilation of data from the modern and also from the, the samples that Junbo has analyzed and also modern in Southern China. So in Southern China today, we see Delta 018 values from wood cellulose of trees growing there that are actually a bit higher than, uh, than the values that we're seeing in the oligocene. And so this, uh, this lowering of Delta 018 values in the past compared to today is telling us that, okay, well, we can explain this in a couple different ways. Either there was a greater transport distance, so we we're much farther inland, we find that to be unlikely, or it was very much colder. Well, we're at a pretty low latitude, so the temperature effect that we would see in something like Siberia is not really on a, a plausible explanation. These values we're seeing from the past look like the Oligocene Siberia, which is controlled by Raleigh distillation, or modern Eastern Canada, which is controlled by temperature, or we have this explanation of an intensified amount effect. Uh, and this value is controlled for, uh, is controlling for differences in seawater source composition. So we take this to mean, well, maybe on average it was raining more in the past. And there's different ways to get it an exact number, but there's details there I'm not going to go into. Okay, so every paleoclimate proxy has growing pain. So let's orient ourselves as to, to where we might be in, uh, in reading these seasonal climate signals in, in mummified wood and what they might be telling us about uh, the, the monsoon system. So this is from Harry Elderfield modified here. So the confidence factor goes up on the y-axis and the time since the proxy was proposed is on the x-axis. All proxies start out early in their lives uh, with an optimism phase. We're really confident the proxy works. And then as it's used and tested, we drop down into this valley of the pessimism phase. Oh my gosh, the answers don't make sense. And then uh, we actually start to climb out of that valley as we work more with the proxies to get to a realism phase. And the answers are never quite what you wanted them to be in the initial phase, but they're more apt and, and more, more realistic. I think right now we're probably still in the optimism phase. I hope that we still have a lot to learn using this mummified wood. Uh, I don't look forward to the pessimism phase, but I think we'll get there soon. And, and I really do look forward to climbing out into the realism phase here. So what have we found? Uh, the fossil wood from Nanning in, in, from the late Oligocene preserves remarkable stable isotope signals. And, and this is zooming into a, a time scale that's really unusual for geologists. We can take our time machine and go all the way back to the late Oligocene and then look at a year-on-year -year record, which is very bizarre. It's, it's weird to go back 25 to 30 million years and then think about an annual basis. And yet that's what we're, we're approaching here, which is pretty neat. The summer to winter rainfall ratios are similar in Southern China in the late, late Oligocene as they are today. And they may even be underestimates. Maybe it rained more in the summer in the past. And given these, uh, any reasonable range of assumptions, we're finding that the true amount of rainfall in the summer and winter is similar to today, but maybe there was a little bit higher mean annual precipitation in the past. We're still working out the details there. An interesting paper that's just come out by Lee and co-authors in Science Advances on sought to relate the uplift of the Tibetan plateau here to on uh, the the ecosystems in southeast China. And they found something really interesting. The central to northern portion of the, the Tibetan uplift, uh, once it gets above something like three kilometers, there's a switch that turns on. And in southern southeast China, broadleaf evergreen ecosystems arise and the the environment gets much wetter in the summer and a modern sea breeze like monsoon turns on. We're finding that maybe this actually occurred not in the Neogene but in the late Oligocene. 
So what, what I hope to convey here is that we still have much to learn in terms of linking up all of our information as we build more and more information from the late Oligocene, from the Oligocene in general. This data gap isn't really helping any of us. And, and I hope that as we build these records, our community continues to, to discuss and share this information. And there's a bit of wiggle room when we say paleogene, neogene boundary of a few million years. So I think that there's a, a bit of time to play with in here still, but it's unlikely that the quote initiation of the East Asian monsoon ever happened all at once. I'd like to thank my collaborators here. Uh, first and foremost, Jamie Vornlocker here. She's uh, doing her PhD right now at the University of Pittsburgh and, and her work in the lab at UL was, was really uh, excellent work. Brian Schubert, Jumbo Ren, Chang Xuan, and Zach Strasberg have really contributed a lot to this work. Uh, Ying Feng Xu at uh, the University of Louisiana is the one who operates the, the mass spec and provides all this wonderful data. Our funding for this work came from a, a, an NSF Paleo Perspectives on Climate Change grant. Uh, and uh, some of this work is also funded by uh, the China Scholarship Council and the Natural Science Foundation of China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for this absolutely fantastic presentation showing us a few, how a few years in Oligocene in South China look like. Now, uh, if there are questions and you want to put them yourself, please do. If not, uh, if you want to send uh, uh, messages to me or to everybody or to uh, Bill, do so by chat. And uh, I see a, a question from Bob Spicer. Yes, please. please. Yeah. Hi, I really enjoyed that talk, uh, in part because it confirms a lot of uh, my, my beliefs, uh, which is always nice. Um, first of all, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the last, the Lee paper. Um, since that was written, um, and I was a co-author on it, uh, we also now believe that the major change was in the late Oligocene, coinciding with uh, the demise of the central uh, Tibetan Valley and the growth of northern Tibet. Uh, basically, by the early Oligocene, we, we have evidence from, from leaves that um, parts of northern Tibet were all already on the rise, and certainly the Hengduan Mountains were. So that, that you know, we would agree with you shifting that uh, a little bit further back in time. Yeah, and thank uh, you for providing the, the tome of papers over the last two years to catch up on. You guys have been very productive. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a busy time, and uh, being in, in lockdown in the UK and not being able to get my hair cut, wasting time getting hair cut for the last year, means I can write more. Um, but uh, I, I would just wanted a, another comment just to come back on the uh, possibility of higher rainfall in Nanning, in the Oligocene. We have a, a, a fossil leaf locality, uh, uh, Shan Sun, which is late Oligocene. And using clamp analysis, we get around two meters of rainfall and a slightly higher seasonal ratio than you get. It's uh, You've got a, a little over three to one, we get six to one. Um, so maybe that is uh, a little bit too high. I, I'm always a little bit anxious about interpreting precip from fossils, plants, yep. largely because they're more interested in the soil moisture than they are what's coming down from the sky. And of course, most of our fossils live around uh, lakes and rivers, otherwise they don't get preserved. So we have a distinct bias towards that. But my, no, my no, question- That would mesh pretty well with our, if the Delta C13 of the atmosphere was had a higher amplitude, our PSPW values would get bumped up closer to what you're saying. Okay, well, that, that's interesting. Um, my question is, is to do with the, uh, the carbon isotopes, and that is, it relates to uh, higher CO2 in the past and um, a change in water use efficiency. And I haven't thought this through, you might have done. Uh, how um, would your results be affected by an increase in, in general atmospheric CO2 and a change in water use efficiency? So the... the uh, the term of latitude with a coefficient in this proxy is, I'd, I've simplified it a little bit. This is an optimized uh, regression function that incorporates not only the delta C13 
value of CO2, but also CO2 partial pressure goes a little into it. In the, the working out of the equation initially by Schubert and Jaron, there was a separate term for CA or, or the atmospheric CO2 concentration, and that fell out of the regression function. Does it actually impact it? Maybe. Does it impact it on a meaningful scale at the resolution and the numbers we're working with? I don't know. And I think that's an area to grow. And I think that's it's a, a big topic in, in tree physiology and mm -hmm. isotopes. So I have to say maybe. Okay. Well, thanks again for a great talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Bob. Another question from David McDonald. Can you go ahead, David? Yeah, thank you, Bill, for a really good talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, I have two sort of linked questions about the uh, assumptions that go into your precipitation calculations. Uh, one concerns the, um, uh, the, 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 the CO2 fluctuation, and you made the point about the Northern Hemisphere in most of the forested landmass. In the Oligocene, of course, Antarctica was probably largely forested do you make allowances for an extra forest continent in the calculation? Uh, this, okay, yeah, that's well, a great yeah. question. <laughs> um, so that's that really would impact this amplitude of the delta C13. Uh, there, there are essentially two balances here. The reason why right now in the Northern hemisphere, there's this big amplitude is because the Southern hemisphere can't really photosynthesize enough for all the respiration that occurs mm -hmm. in the Northern hemisphere, that contributes to this imbalance. Now, how much of mixing of the gas occurs on an annual basis between the Southern and Northern hemispheres? A little bit unknown uh, from my perspective, maybe other people in other disciplines know it. If there was a perfect balance between the two hemispheres, I don't really know what the exact number would be for that term. It's possible it is possible that the value would uh, decrease a little bit. And so what would that do? It would, oh, hold on, let me go back real quickly. It's if it, there are any circumstances where we start to approach a full balance in photosynthesis and respiration, such that this term has no amplitude at all. And I think that's what a huge forest on Antarctica and perfect mixing may do. We'd still, our estimates would still be in the preponderance of summer dominated rainfall, just not quite as much, but there's not much difference right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the other, the other question was about the, the temperature uh, effect uh, comparing Southern China with Siberia. Now, obviously you're, you're a long way south compared to Siberia, but you're hoping that your results are typical of the whole East Asian monsoon area. And you go to the northern edge of that, and in the Oligocene, uh, I've worked a lot on Sakhalin. And in Sakhalin, in the Oligocene, there was a rapid chilling. Uh, seawater temperatures fell to below zero in some places. There's a lot of, lot of evidence, evidence for that. So, I, I, I'm just a note of caution that there was a lot of cold weather around at that time, and perhaps it might be some sort of more than one effect on 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 the position of uh, of your of your South China bar uh, compared to Siberia and the South China today. Wonderful feedback, and I do appreciate that, and I agree that there's a lot we still we still have to learn, and there's a, there's some uncertainty in pinning an exact number in there as to what process predominates and what does it mean for an exact number of rainfall amount. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so heading toward the pessimist phase? Hey, hey, maybe, I hope so. Ooh. I wanna get out of that. <laughs> you just wanna get to the realist phase. That's right. Uh, so if uh, I don't see any other questions uh, until other people are thinking of more of questions, I have a question that's not much related to the science, but I was impressed when you compared the uh, Lagerstätte to a dump truck. So uh, in a few words, what's the story of that uh, fossil site? Um, you know, I've been on Google Maps trying to find it, and I think there are buildings there. 
I see. So uh, my understanding, and, and I've never been there, I've, I've never been to China. Uh, I, my understanding is the collections were done during construction and they're stored in a, in a museum now. Yeah, it looked like uh, it's in the middle of the city. Yeah, it's it is. Like, and and it's, it's like a street city. corner now. <laughs> okay. yep. Well, thank you again, uh, Bill. It was wonderful to uh, learn something extremely new about the monsoon. Thanks for having me and thanks for the great feedback. Yes, yeah, so uh, we'll have uh, next week uh, uh, Dick Kroon talking about the connection between monsoon and uh, global climate and uh, biogenic blooms in the ocean uh, on Schedule B hosted by Tara. Uh, you're welcome to tune in next week. Thank you very much again.